Hi, I'm Jimmy. In this video, we're looking at some of the best ways to value different types of stocks. Now, we came up with this idea because we're actually developing a website where we're, where we're going to calculate the fair value of different stocks, of different types of stocks. The theory is that you could punch in a ticker and it will kick back not just the fair value, but it will tell you what's the best valuation method to use, what's the second best valuation method, what's the third best, and what's the fair value according to each one. So we're going to use this video as a chance to show you where we're trying to, the future of the website, sort of where we're trying to bring everything. So to illustrate that, let me show, most importantly, different ways, some of the best ways to value different types of stocks. So for that, we've created a chart. Now, on the x-axis down here at the bottom, well, we're starting from a company that has no profit or negative profit, a company that's losing money, or negative free cash flow. Then we're going to, as we move along the line, the company will gradually be stabilizing, and then the company from there will gradually develop where they have stable profit and stable free cash flow. By the way, if you're curious, profit and net income are the same thing. Those two numbers are used, those two words are using, used interchangeably. Okay, and then on the y-axis, well, we have a company that has no growth or negative growth or going all the way up to a company that is fast growing. Now, we don't have an actual percentage tied to that because that will depend, that will vary a lot from industry to industry. So depending on the industry you look at, well, this, the vertical axis could change. But basically, the the ideal valuation method to use is something like discounted cash flow. But discounted cash flow does not cover all stocks. It only covers stocks that have free cash flow and ultimately profit stabilizing and ideally stable. Now, I don't want people to think that this entire area should be treated the same when it comes to a discounted cash flow perspective. For example, if a company were to land right here on the chart, where they don't have a ton of growth, but they have very stable or very predictable free cash flow and profit ultimately. Well, for that, you only have to project out a couple years from a free cash flow project from a free cash flow perspective. But what if a company is, let's say, on this side of it? If they're over there, that might be a company like Intel. Intel, where free cash flow is not quite stable yet, well, you gotta usually make sense to project out a few more years. So you project out from where they're stabilizing to where they will be stable. The same is true for all different locations on this chart. Depending on where the company might fall, well, discounted cash flow usually works fairly well. The primary difference, for that, let's color this chart. The primary difference is in the darker areas, you just want to project out a bit more years. You want to go out additional years. If they have high growth going out more years, gives a gradual, a linear decline to their growth. It'll be less, it'll be less conservative and a bit more accurate. It's unlikely that a company is going to grow from, you know, go from growing 15% a year down to 2% a year. So going out more years makes that decline a bit more gradual. Going out, if they have, if they're not stabilized from a free cash flow perspective, well, you project out a few more years, give them time to stabilize their free cash flow. So generally, we'll clean this chart up a bit, but generally, discounted cash flow works quite well there. But what if the company, does, we're not quite sure how predictable their free cash flow is? Well, one valuation method we could use is enterprise value to EBITDA. EBITDA is short for earnings before interest, taxes, and depreciation. Well, if the company, pretty much no matter how fast they're growing, is if they're not quite profitable, if they have negative profit or negative free cash flow, this is a good valuation method to use. It's simple. It's sort of like price to earnings, but it accounts for some of the cash, some of the debt. It could be a bit more all-encompassing than the PE ratio is. Now, what if the company is so new or so small that they don't even have positive EBITDA? EBITDA is better than profit because it's higher up the income statement, so odds are it would be a positive number. But if they're super small or super young, they might not be positive. If that's the case, we can go to enterprise value to sales. Enterprise value to sales is most companies should have positive sales. By the way, sales and revenue, two numbers are interchangeable. It's the top line in the income statement. And most companies are going to have positive sales. The only exception to that that I've ever seen is I have seen some financial stocks that do not have positive revenue. 
I've seen it with companies like a Blackstone or something like that. And that's a, an accounting thing. It's how they account, how they have to account for the profit that they make or the revenue that they make. So it is possible that they're negative. That is actually why that is an outlier. And for financial stocks, we typically, I'm going to put that off the screen here, that we typically would use something like a price to book value or price to tangible book value. If we have a financial stock, a bank, an insurance company, many different types of investment companies, typically these are better valuation methods. Now, if you want to get more, if you want a more advanced way to value banks and financial stocks in general, something like equity discounted cash flow is a good valuation method to use. Now, if you ever took any finance classes, you might have learned about equity discounted cash flow. But that, in the case of a financial stock, it is not the same as discounted cash flow that we have in the green box here. They're not the same. Similar concept, but it's it's the process is different. We're going to do videos on how to do that valuation method if you'd like to do it. But again, this is this is sort of where we're trying to bring the website. We're trying to bring our website that if you punch in a, a ticker, it automatically recognizes it's a financial stock. Here's the price to book value. Here's the price to tangible book value. Here's the industry average. Here's their own historical average. Here's where their stock should be trading. And here's what the fair value is for that stock based on their own history or based on the industry. So we're also going to have it calculate the equity DCF. So that's where the website's trying to go. But again, we're going to do videos on each of these. We'll put together a playlist for you. Uh, in fact, I'll link in the description below a playlist for the ones we've done so far, and we will gradually add all of them. Okay, now another outlier we should be aware of that doesn't fall into this typical scale is something known as equity REITs. REIT is short for Real Estate Investment Trust. An equity REIT is a real estate company that invests in actual real estate properties. The advantage to equity REITs is they tend to pay big dividends. So the company gets tax advantages if they pay out most of their profits as dividends. These can be very good investments, especially if we think real estate's going to do quite well. Now, a specialty way to analyze, to come up with a fair value for REITs is something known as the net asset value. You might see this called NAV for short. Well, net asset value can be tricky to do. It's basically you're taking what is the value of all the properties minus what is owed on those properties. Well, in theory, that's the value. That's the net asset value. Ideally, we want to pay less than that. Again, this is a, a feature of the website that we wanted to be able to quickly and easily calculate the fair value for a REIT. Now, there are actually two different types of REITs. There's equity REITs and mortgage REITs. Mortgage REITs are companies that invest in mortgages. But if you see a mortgage REIT, they don't fall into this purple category. They actually, they're more of a, uh, a financial stock. They'd fall into the blue category. If you ever see one, a better valuation method to use would be price to book value or even price to tangible book value. So if you're ever looking at mortgage REITs, again, they usually pay pretty good dividends too. And they make money off of, they buy mortgages and they collect the payments. So as long as repayments and mortgages are pretty good, that could be fairly good, especially as mortgage rates start to go up. Those might be a potential investment to consider. Our third and final outlier is something known as the dividend discount model or DDM for short. Now this works well with stocks or even ETFs that have predictable dividends. If a company has a predictable dividend, well, the dividend discount model, it can be compared to something like discounted cash flow. It is actually considered a discounted cash flow valuation method. But in discounted cash flow, standard discounted cash flow, the big box here, well, in discounted cash flow, we're saying how much free cash flow is the company going to generate and what is that worth today to the entire company? With the dividend discount model, you're saying, ultimately what we're saying is, how much cash are they going to pay us, the investors? How much is directly going to come to us? Well, I want to pay less than that. Again, this is a valuation method that will go onto the website at some point. We're gradually going to build in all of these different valuation methods and automate the whole process. Now, when we look at this entire chart, you may notice that some, some valuation methods, some more popular valuation methods are missing. So let's clean this up real quick. And one of the ones that I think are important, especially for faster growing stocks, is something known as the PEG ratio. PEG ratio, 
tends to work fairly well with faster growing companies. You could do it with any company, but it tends to work fairly well with faster growing companies. PEG ratio is short for price to earnings growth. This is very similar to the PE ratio, which falls right about here on the chart. Now, along the same lines as PE, PE by the way is price to earnings, PEG is price to earnings growth. The difference between those two is that the PEG ratio accounts for growth. So you might see a stock, the reason that faster growing companies might, PE might not be good for that is picture a stock like a Tesla. Well, a Tesla is trading right now. I don't know what it's trading at, but before it was trading at a 300 PE. People see that and say, well, that's way overvalued where that might not be the right valuation method. PEG would be Basically, it takes the PE and accounts for it. It accounts for, yeah, it's got a PE of 10, but it's also growing much faster. When we account for that, how does it normalize the number? It could be a good valuation method to use. Again, these are valuation methods that we're going to be adding to our website. Another one that I think is quite good and better for more stable, for companies that generate more stable free cash flow is price to free cash flow. Price to cash flow is exactly what it sounds like. It is just like price to earnings, except it is price divided by the cash flow of the company. Now, I don't want anybody to think that over on the right side is just price to cash flow and over on the left side is just price to earnings. No, price to earnings could easily be applied to the entire box, the entire section, the entire orange box. It could look like that. On the flip side, price to cash flow could be the entire box as well. It, they could both be there. The reason that we separated the two is that price to cash flow is better. It is more effective when cash flow is more stable. Price to earnings can be better when it is less stable. Now, I personally like price to cash flow better just because cash flow tends to be, you can't manipulate it as easily. A company can't manipulate cash flow quite as easily as they can manipulate earnings or profit uh, because not from a moral standpoint or an ethical standpoint but an accounting rule standpoint it's easier to sh pick accounting rules that make your earnings look better than it you know it's tougher to change your the accounting rules to favor cash flow so that's why i tend to prefer price to cash flow but one of the reasons that we're on the website when you punch in a ticker that it will suggest multiple different valuation methods right now we just have discounted cash flow but at some point it's going to suggest you know, depending on where it falls, what type of company is, how fast is it growing, how predictable are those numbers, depending on where it lands, well, the website will recommend, hey, discounted cash flow is the ideal method. That's the first one. You know, it's a $50 stock. The fair value is maybe $60. Price to cash flow, maybe it's $55. Price to earnings, maybe it's $65. You know, it'll throw it. And, then, you know, it'll throw out different results depending on which valuations are best in that particular situation. If we punch in a ticker and it's a bank, well, none of these are going to be appropriate. Well, price to earnings could actually be appropriate, but price to tangible book value, price to book value, uh, equity DCF, and then maybe PE is on the bottom of that list. Each of those are very doable, but it'll rank them for us and give us a, what the fair value is. This is the vision. This is the future where we're trying to bring the website. Again, if you'd like to come over and sign up, we've got discounted cash flow working right now. Every day we're trying to refine it, trying to make it better, trying to bring new valuation methods to it. So if you'd like to come over and sign up, we got. I will leave a link in the description below. We've also got a private investment community that is, you know, it's a really great community where people are there to help each other and try to guide each other along. We're sharing our experiences, sharing insight that we have on different companies. We're doing different research projects together. So if you'd like to sign up, again, link in the description below. I got a link right here. And thank you so much for sticking with me all the way to the end of the video. I really do appreciate it. Thank you, and I'll see you in the next video.